The Feast of the Assumption, which we celebrate today and the, the tradition of honoring Mary, had a late start in the church. Father Dennis McBride, an Irish redemptress, gives us a wonderful synthesis of the background. And he points out that in the first four centuries of the church's history, there was little, if any, devotion to Our Lady and little reflection on her place in history, let alone in sacred history. During that period of time, the pressing question for the church was the true identity of Jesus. And they were fully absorbed in finding an answer to the complex questions surrounding the humanity and the divinity of Jesus. It was only after the divinity of Jesus was proclaimed in the early councils did attention turn to Mary. In the Council of Ephesus in the year 431, it devoted much attention to the subject of how the Son of God was given birth to humanly. It was then that the church gave Mary one of her first and original titles, the oldest title, Theotokos, which is a, a Greek word, which literally means God-bearing. To affirm that Jesus had a human birth, the council fathers at Ephesus proclaimed that Mary was Theotokos, and she bore Jesus in her womb and gave birth to him like any mother. When we look back, we will see that up until the middle of the 6th century, there were no feasts in the church to celebrate and honor Mary. She was remembered alongside the saints and the martyrs. On the other hand, the Eastern Church had plenty of Marian feasts, celebrating her conception, her birth, her presentation in the temple, and her Annunciation. Their most important Marian feast was the Assumption. In all of the Marian feasts, of the Eastern Church were adopted by the Roman Church and became part of our calendar. Although the Assumption was only proclaimed as a dogma in 1950, the Assumption has been taught in the Church for centuries as a belief that emerged from the faith of very ordinary people. And the origin of the feast was the belief of many Christians that Mary's body could not have undergone decay after being separated from her soul at death. They could not imagine that her body would disintegrate after the unique role that she played in history. People came to believe that Mary was bodily assumed into heaven, and that is the essence of the dogma that it was proved in 1950. The Gospel passage from Luke is one of the most beautiful and profound pieces that we encounter in the entire scripture. Mary responds to the need of her elderly cousin, even though Mary herself is pregnant and underwent this very difficult and dangerous journey. What we celebrate is a woman who lived her life bringing goodness to others. Mary was the little one, the lowly one, made great by a choice of God. Her Magnificat tells us that the same choice is extended to the lowly. A preference for the poor and oppressed runs throughout the entire Bible. And it says very powerfully in her Magnificat, God has brought down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He's filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. You know, attempts to soften it or simply ignore the biblical promises they're just not worth it because this is something that we find over and over again in the scriptures. The power of God is revealed in history through God's salvific deeds and it's the source of profound rejoicing. And that's the case of Mary. She rejoices. It speaks, the scriptures speak to us of Mary treasuring and pondering all these things in her heart. And the joy that she experienced prepared her to announce and to proclaim the good news. If you look at all the verses in the Magnificat, they all lead up to the central point. And the central point of the Magnificat is the holiness of God. And God is holy. Holy is God's name. It's the foundation of what we celebrate for the Feast of the, Ascent, of the Assumption, that everything comes from God and God's gratuitous love for each and every one of us. The following prayers and reflections that we'll finish with are from Joyce Rupp. Mother of God, you risked saying yes to being pregnant with the seed of the Holy One. May we also overcome our fears and take the risks that spiritual growth requires of us. 
Mother of God, you offered the hospitality of your womb as a dwelling place for the Holy One. May we continually open the womb in our hearts as a dwelling place for the Holy One. Mother of God, the newly born child in your arms engendered awe, mystery, and wonder. May we too reverence and be awed by the way that the Divine One enters our life. Please stand and join with me as we pray together our creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And we join this day as we celebrate this Eucharist with the intentions of the many people who join us via television and the intentions that we have in our own hearts. Lord, we ask you to be attentive to all of these prayers and our needs. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray for those people who are victims of violence and the victims of war. For all of them, we pray to the Lord. Lord and we pray for the grace to be like Mary, to ponder, to treasure the workings of God in our own lives, to be able to say with Mary that God is holy. For that grace for each of us, we pray to the Lord. Lord and all of this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. 